Hi and welcome to the GMC Sunday podcast from the team at GMC, Gillespie Memorial Church in Dunfermline, Scotland. I'm Pastor Mike Weaver, Minister here at GMC, and with our team, Reverend Maggie Lane, Reverend David Melville and Elder Ronnie Aitken, we're leading our church to be a people of God seeking to grow in God's word and so be a blessing to the city with the good news of Jesus Christ. Our sermon series, Living in the Light of Christ's Return, Understanding God's Promise in the Return of Christ, now moves us into St. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. At first reading, its themes might seem not particularly relevant to us today, but it covers persecution, which Christians have always faced in and is growing in many places in the world today. It reminds us not to let go of God's word as the church, a very timely reminder when this is happening in so many Christian communities. And it challenges idleness and instead encourages work, not for our own gain, but for the Lord's. So thanks for joining us, and I pray this podcast will be a blessing to you as we seek the truths in the word of God. But before that, we come to the Lord in prayer. Sovereign and Almighty Father, we gather this morning in your house seeking to worship you with every fiber of our being, seeking you with all our heart, mind, strength, and soul. You are the God of everything, God of creation, from chaos creating order, from nothing creating life making the impossible possible. So Lord, we give you all thanks and honor and glory this morning for the possibility of life in all its joy and fullness. Despite so much depravity of our heart, mind and soul, you make a way for us. So Father, let us bring forward in our thoughts the failings of our hearts the distraction towards sinfulness of our minds leading to a darkness of the soul. Lord God, as we contemplate our weakness and trembling before the throne, let us acknowledge the light of Christ Jesus who comes to bear upon us. For Lord Jesus, your atoning sacrifice upon the cross washes us clean of our sin. Your raising from the grave casts our sin into the depths of the oceans, far away from us. Lord, may all guilt be banished. All the concerns brought before you assuaged, and may each and every one here this day come under the deep assurance of your mercy, your joy, your love, in the hope of eternal glory in your kingdom come and yet to come. We praise you, Lord, for all the giftings of your heart to us, all your provision to us, and we give back to you. We thank you for the giftings of this congregation, for the work of your church. And so, yes, Lord, we praise you, we thank you, and we say together the words Jesus, our Redeemer, taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. I hope through our prayers your heart is ready to receive deeply from God's Word. Whatever life is thrown your way currently, whether life is going great or times are stormy, please know that the Word of God is powerful. God's Word is able to challenge, to transform and ultimately to change your life. So listen in to the reading and the exposition from our preacher. If the reading from the Bible and the message from our preacher raises any questions or doubts or maybe challenges you over the way you are living life today, 
or perhaps you just want to know more about the way of Christ and getting to know the Lord Jesus, then we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch via our website or through the office. Details are in our show notes. If you'd like to support GMC financially and our ministry for the kingdom, then offering details can be found on the homepage of our website, gillespiechurch.org. Now, over to our preacher. So having uh, just finished last week St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, we are going to dive straight into the second letter to this same group of Christian believers, most likely written only a few months after that first letter. Paul seemed to need to write to clear up confusion around the second coming of the Lord, the parousia, the eschaton. He'd already written, as we've heard in the past weeks, about encouragement and comfort in their faith, because they were under attack in some senses, and he affirmed the reality of the return of Jesus Christ. But some among them, it must have been reported back to uh, Paul, even after his first letter, are not following his counsel. Some had stopped working, assuming Christ was coming. We heard a little of that in the first letter. And the persecution of the church was continuing, so surely the Lord the day of the Lord must be at hand, some were thinking. So Paul's second shorter letter addresses three issues, which we'll deal with in the coming weeks. Discrimination or persecution, whichever term you want to use, and living for Christ's glory. There's deception and the return of Christ. And lastly, it's about disobedience and in disobedience, needing to hold on to Christ's message. As with all Paul's letters, there are introductory and closing remarks, and in 1 Thessalonians, the two halves of the letter are hinged by a prayer in the middle. Not quite in the middle. Uh, In 2 Thessalonians, it comes at the end of chapter 2, at uh, verse 16 and 17. Before this prayer, at that point, in chapter 1, Paul will address, as I've said, discrimination. In the second chapter, deception. And after the central prayer in the final chapter, chapter 3, encouragement of the gospel faithfulness alongside disobedience of the church. It kind of wraps up three things that I've kind of included, I think, in my prayer there. Three big concerns that can affect all Christians, namely the effects of the world, discrimination, persecution from the world, deception, the devil, being deceived to move away from the things of Christ, and then disobedience, the disobedience of our own flesh, our own selves. So by way of an introduction to this series, We're going to hear from God's Word, but uh, we're taking from all three places. I'm going to read the introduction from chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, that central hinging prayer in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, and the concluding exhortation from 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, 16 to 18. So if you're able, follow along in your Bibles. It's on the screen. Um, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Hear the Word of God. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then from the end of chapter 2, starting at 16. Now, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and the God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And then the closing verses from uh, chapter 3, from 16 to the end. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. 
The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness of every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Father, we thank you for your holy word. It's reading to us. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Do you have anything lying around your house that's redundant? Maybe in the garden or storage areas? Now Alex lives with us at home. We have a fair amount of gardening, gardening equipment. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many lawn mowers we have. I didn't know you needed so many. I had my own, but my own wasn't very good. It had some damage to it. When you mowed with it, it left grass on the lawn. It was damaged underneath. And so I figured, seeing as Alex has some, I needed to get rid of it. So a few weeks ago, I took it to the recycling center because, well, Alex has new and better equipment, so why not use his? In fact, even better, why not let him just cut the lawn? <laughs> Which is, tends to be what happens. I'm blessed. There are folk out there who think the Bible is a little like my old mower. It was useful back then, but now, well, there are better things around and I don't need it anymore. And when you dive into 2 Thessalonians, it might even seem more to be the case. Because when you read 2 Thessalonians, it seems to come from a different age, as one commentary put it. It it's hard to fathom what relevance it has for today. And that's how many people see the Bible. Maybe even how some Christians see this particular, particular letter. It's as useful as my old lawnmower. So surely better replace it with something more worthwhile and useful. Like people do. The latest life coaching, body enhancing, mind expanding advice of the world from friends and influencers in the world of social media and AI. We can get all the answers to life's issues, can't we, from anywhere? And people would say we can get it from anywhere but God's Word. Can't we? No, I don't believe we can. The Bible is not, and this second letter to the Thessalonian believers is not redundant. It's not to be replaced by something newer. It's rather more like an unloved and discarded vase, pulled off a dusty shelf, something that was just part of the background, something maybe, you know, someone's inherited, see it on the antiques roto, inherited and it just sits there gathering dust, and one day somebody looks at it and looks at the mark and finds out they've got a Ming vase. The Bible should not be on our shelves gathering dust. It is valuable in its entirety and all parts of it. So blow off the dust and we find treasure and value in it. The treasure which is eternal hope for those who can see the opportunity within. Have any of you heard of a man called, a Portuguese man called um, Bartolomeu Dias? Oh, I'm seeing a nod. Excellent. He was a 15th century mariner. And Dias captained an expedition down the west coast of Africa. He was the first to round the southern tip of Africa. Very first. And, well, and his crew, obviously. He wasn't sailing alone. And on the ship's return, they went round the southern coast of Africa. And on the trip back, they encountered the Cape of Good Hope in May 1488. But Diaz didn't name it the Cape of Good Hope. He named it the Cabo das Tormentas, the Cape of Storms, because of the weather. It was King John of Portugal who later named it the Cape of Good Hope because it provided a gateway to India and the riches beyond in the Orient. Cape of Good Hope. 
The Thessalonians were also experiencing storms, not storms of the seas, but storms of life from outside and from within their own community. Yet Paul writes in this letter and the previous of the good hope, the hope of riches beyond the storms of life, if they would just put their confidence and trust in the Lord Jesus. And these opening words mirror closely those in his first letter. If you later compare his opening of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, the words are very similar. In 1 Thessalonians 1.6, you received the, the word in much affliction. In 2.14, you, for you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. And that Timothy was sent to establish and exhort them in their faith, so that no one be moved by these afflictions. We'll hear next week of the increase of the intensification of this enduring persecution. But here, in the opening, in the closing statements of the letter, Paul suggests a remedy for this issue of discrimination, of persecution. And it is to rest in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In both these letters, Paul addresses them as the church of the Thessalonians in God. First as God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, is how he addresses them in 1 Thessalonians. But in the second, God, our Father. God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So though living in the storms of life, their place is in God, the Father, of all creation, but also God, our Father, which speaks of being personally known by this God of the creation of all. And how? By the grace of the Son. And verse 2 speaks of that grace given. Grace and peace which comes from God, their Father and Jesus. That is their security. That is their assurance. Their hope wrapped up in God's eternal purpose. Which is what? Paul closes out the letter with. It's an assurance that despite any and all fierce opposition, God's grace brings security. And so he signs off. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. How many times we finish our Kirk Session meetings, you may finish your life group meetings, we, we sometimes finish worship by closing with the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us. Do we understand what we mean when we say that? We are essentially acknowledging and blessing one, other, one another with the blood of Christ. That's the grace, the, the blood shed on the cross given for us. And through that, nothing can separate us from the love of God. No opposition, no persecution, no discrimination. Nothing. The second issue moves from the world and its persecution and deals with the sin of the devil's deception. You know that original sin where the devil says, did God really say? Did he? We know what Jesus said. It is written. Sometimes it's difficult when we're living life to say it is written. But the Thessalonian church had a high view of the return of Jesus and the teachings of Paul, rightly regarding it as the word of God. But some had been deceived into believing and accepting that the day of the Lord had already arrived from words that had not come from Paul. All these things we'll be going to over the next few weeks. Remember, I'm just dealing with the, how the opening and closing statements deal with these um, three themes. But that deception would create 
considerable misunderstanding and damage to the Christian community. It would undermine confidence in the coming of Jesus, who would bring salvation and justice upon his return. But we can see Paul affirms the confidence they can have in his letter. Because in closing he writes, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Why is he saying that? He wants to give them the assurance this word they are receiving is from him. The man who along with Silvanus and Timothy spent the three or so weeks with them and planted this church. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. Paul wants them to know the genuineness of the word, that it isn't. If, it, if it's not sounding like this, it's not from him. It's not from God. This is an apostolic authority conveying the message within, and therefore security and assurance can be found in it. It is the same assurance we as Christians have in the canon of the Bible. Confidence in the breathed word of God, alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, as it says in Hebrews. And then moving on, the third issue, the one of the self, the flesh, is deliberate disobedience. Paul has addressed this in 1 Thessalonians, but the fact the issue is ongoing highlights the deliberate nature of the disobedience. If it's been highlighted to them, no, don't be doing this, but they're continuing to do it, that's deliberate disobedience. And so he deals with it in chapter 3 in a strong way. But along with those strong words... Paul also reminds the church that the disobedient remain brothers, brothers and sisters. It speaks to a concern for peace and harmony, dare I say unity of the church. So Paul in his closing prays a peace, not just on the majority but also on those few causing the problems. Now may the Lord of Peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Not the Lord be with those of you who are honouring the Lord. Not with those who are being nice. The Lord be with you all. The whole family. So Paul at both the beginning and end of the letter speaks into these presenting issues not to specifically highlight the problems or detail solutions, but rather to bring to them God's grace, God's word, and God's peace. But what about the central hinge, the prayer at 2, 16 and 17? Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, it says in verse 16, This love of Christ and God is for believers. And it is the grace that brings eternal comfort and good hope. Is that not what you want in persecution? Comfort and hope? Is that not what people are seeking? And justice in all circumstances? This is a prayer that offers eternal life where no matter the injustices one faces in life, for the believer in Jesus, ultimate justice is found at Christ's return. And once you have that straight in your mind, in your head, you begin to understand that God is in control of your life in Christ. Many of you, if you're on the prayer chain, will have received an update from my friend and brother in Christ, Andy Chittick, this week. In it, Andy referenced, for those who don't know, he's a friend in Edinburgh um, who's suffering from cancer at the moment. And in Andy's prayer update, he referenced, referenced a conversation between Pilate and Jesus in John 19. You know, when Jesus is in that last few days. And Pilate asked him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power 
either to free you or to crucify you. And Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. You would have no power. And then I'll read what some of you may have already read. Andy, his update shared this. <coughs> Jesus' words to Pilate did not change the gravity of the situation, but it changed the perspective of those in it. As I look at the medical, medical prognosis I face, these words of Jesus are helping daily to change my perspective. God is in control of my life, my health, my destiny. He is total love and total power. The cancer is not the primary power over my health. God is. I'm willing to trust his love and power in the gravity of the situation. Cancer cannot win. It must answer to God's greater eternal power. Pilate's power over Jesus' body was limited and temporary. The same is true of the power of sarcoma over me. All this is for God's glory. Although we pray for restoration, for healing, and absolutely do so in expectation, hope, and a deep trust in the goodness of God, as Christians we also know we pray with an eschatological hat on, an eye looking to the future glory of the coming of the Lord. When the promises of God to all believers will be fully revealed in glory. Yet though we live with this assurance of faith in the future glory, we inhabit the here and now with all the brokenness in the world. Because the present matters. We cannot just live for the future. Though we do. That's the dichotomy. So when Paul continues the prayer, he goes on. I'll read again, 16, but into 17. Now may, the, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and the God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Paul is praying for the Thessalonians' future glory in Christ, but also that their lives would be glorified now in their living, in their persecution, in all the problems they are having. On the positive side, Paul wants them to pray that even as he, Silas, and Timothy are working for the gospel, it will affect others as it had themselves. He's wanting them to pray for God's glory to come in powerful ways on this earth, for more people to come to know the Lord. Negatively, he wants the Thessalonians to avoid any and all activities which would bring the name of Jesus into disrepute. Ultimately, this prayer that hinges the letter focuses on the glory of Christ. That they as believers would see the glory of Christ as hope and encouraging, hope and eternal encouragement, sorry, and that they would work for his glory each and every day of their lives. That's the role, the purpose of all Christians in life, no matter what we seem to be facing. And that's the encouragement I see in Andy's closing words. That as he is, and his family, his wife Nairi and their four children, are going through these struggles, these trials, that he can write, all this is for God's glory. But what is this glory that we cannot see? Because we cannot see it. I'll leave you with an Old Testament reference speaking to this eternal truth and to the eternal glory of God. That regardless of life's pressures, we are called to remember the church is secure. You are secure by God's grace in Christ Jesus. If you want to turn, you can do to your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6. 
you will find Elisha the prophet is trapped. The Arameans, the king of Aram, was at war with Israel, and Elisha warns the king of Israel of the Arameans' whereabouts so they can avoid them. And the king of Aram hears about this, and he becomes enraged. He is not happy with Elisha, so he sends out horses and chariots and a strong force to surround Dothan, where Elisha is staying. And then we hear these words from verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What am I seeing in this story? Though in life we may feel surrounded, we're not alone. Though we might believe the troubles of the world and the untruths of the world are coming in upon our lives, we are not alone. Though we may be really feeling the pressures of life in the world, whether on health or finances, in your relationships, in your work life, or even challenges to your faith and belief, know this, you are surrounded by God. I say this to every man and woman and child, you are surrounded by God. People, whether of no faith or other faiths, whether they are a mature Christian or a new believer, all are surrounded by the Lord. The question, though, is not to acknowledge all are surrounded by God, but, are, but to ask, are you in God and he in you? All may be surrounded by God, but all are not in God. But for those who are, that is the place of peace that passes all understanding. It's what I read in Andy's letters, it's what I pray for him, and it's what I see. A peace beyond all understanding. And it is there, when we are in peace with God, he uses us to glorify him. It's a knowledge of the presence of Christ in your life that leads to assurance that you are completely in God's hands, whatever the thoughts and plans of others. That is the Christian hope. Just as it was for the Thessalonian church so many centuries ago. And so as we go into the remaining weeks of this series, which will finish the week before Advent, may you know that your life, that my life, Whatever we do and whatever the challenge, we do it all for God's glory. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you for your word. That in the world where whether we are finding ourselves struggling, discriminated against or persecuted, whether we are being deceived and coming under that deception or whether our own flesh is being disobedient, Lord, that you would call us to you for being in you through your Son, through his grace and mercy. Everything is possible. And so with an eye to future glory, the coming of our Lord, we live in this life for your glory on earth, for your kingdom has come and is yet to come. So this day, as we close out our worship, Lord, and we have been the church gathered, may we go into the world with you in our hearts to proclaim your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Thanks for listening to the Sunday podcast from our team. 
If you'd like more details about GMC and who we are, what we believe and how we serve, then visit our website at gillespiechurch.org. Find us on Facebook or look back at some of the videos on our YouTube channel. Just search Gillespie Memorial Church. All inquiries can be made through the Contact Us page on our website. Again, details are in the show notes. If you'd like to support our work with a financial donation, then offerings can be made by clicking the Support Us with Stewardship icon through the homepage of our website. If you liked what you heard, then please follow our podcast page, like it and share it with friends and family. This has been a production of GMC, including the pastors and the tech team, or copyright remains with the producers. Today's episode was edited by Jack Wiggle, and the soundtrack is Blessed Assurance by the team at City of Light, performed by Gordon Eastop and Mike Weaver. Thanks for listening, and God bless.